something exists which is as inevitable as death, life. of Alicante in eastern Spain, a natural habitat. When autumn comes, hundreds of thousands of birds gather in great flocks and start an epic journey. Birds that may appear fragile fly for more than 15,000 kilometers from northern Europe to the far reaches of Africa. On this long migration to the south, they instinctively use the coastline to find their way during this arduous journey, their lives depend on a series of locations where they can rest and recover their strength. The province of Alicante is one of these privileged places. Its variety of natural habitats are of unique ecological importance. In a relatively small space, we find an immense diversity of living creatures and landscapes. The north, with its rugged mountains and cliffs, gradually gives way to the plains and sandy beaches of the south, offering the fauna and vegetation a huge variety of natural environments. More than 200 kilometers of coastline, together with six different inland ecosystems, make this a very special place. The sea hides many secrets from mankind. Life began underwater, and from there came the first inhabitants of the earth, venturing inland to conquer a new environment. The sea provides for an abundance and diversity of living forms. The underwater landscape is similar to the continent with mountains, valleys, meadows and sandbanks. Most of the living creatures congregate in the shallow waters where the sandbanks alternate with the rocky surfaces, as in Nueva Tabarca or Benidorm Island. The light penetrates easily in these waters and allows the existence of large meadows of Posidonia, a plant with flowers which, after a brief period on land, has returned to live underwater. A great variety of seaweed gives shelter to and feeds a number of animal species, whilst at the same time providing oxygen for its environment and helping to stop erosion. The oxygen produced by underwater vegetation is a major part of that produced by the whole planet and thanks to this creatures living in and out of the water are able to breathe. Plankton is composed of millions of microscopic animals and plants which are always moving. Many different species feed upon it, like the fragile seahorse. They, in turn, are food for other predators. In these areas, 
living things stick to the rocks and to the strong platforms to avoid being swept away by the current. Small mollusks, crabs, anemones, sea stars and a multitude of other invertebrates are the most common fauna to be found. Crabs are most sought after by the carnivores, hence their ability to hide in crevices and beneath the sand. Sometimes they're caught by surprise and lose an extremity or die after a long struggle. On the surface, Seagulls live at the expense of the small fish which they're able to catch and on the scraps tossed onto the shore by the waves. They reproduce on the coastal shelf and on small coastal islands. On ledges formed by the rocks, they make a shallow nest and bring up their chicks. During the first year, they have a dark grey plumage which distinguishes them at a glance from the adults. They are given special treatment which avoids confrontation as they are not regarded as rivals. When they come of age, the young ones face together their temporary helplessness. There are still places in the Mediterranean where sea turtles come each year to lay their eggs on the beach. The green turtle is a rare species which faces the same danger as the sea from whence it comes. Its head is strong and endowed with a very powerful corneous beak with dented sides as in some birds which allows it to hold its catch and to cut hard food. On some beaches, chains of dunes still form parallel to the sea, even though they've been replanted with pine trees. From the Arenales to Guadamar del Segura extends one of the last well-preserved dune ranges. Given force by the wind, the sand becomes a potent abrasive, making the surface soft and unstable, only allowing the proliferation of certain plants, like the summer teal, which adapts easily to this particular environment. The reforestation, carried out to halt the advance of the dunes, displaced the original vegetation and modified the landscape. This benefited the fauna, which found a more hospitable environment in the pine groves. However, the dune slowly continues its advance, like a living thing, at the rate of around 15 centimetres a year. In its path, it buries pines, shrubs, anything that gets in its way. The remains appear scattered everywhere, suffocated by the sand. However, the front of the dunes are still colonised by resistant species, like the Ammophila, which helps to slow down their progress. In spring, the butterflies of the dune pollinate the flowers, and yet in their earlier caterpillar stage, they devastate those same flowers. At sunset, one of the most feared predators of the dune begins its work, the Scarites. It's a large beetle with lethal jaws. The red lizard is a reptile typical of this environment. It moves easily through the sand and adapts easily to its surroundings. 
To catch its prey by surprise, the grey snake has ventured into the open dune, an arid and hostile environment. The red lizard is able to escape and runs to burrow a hole in the sand. In this hiding place, the Kentish plover has made its nest, just a shallow depression surrounded by shells. When the wind blows inland, over the sand near the rivers and watercourses, curious formations occur. Over hundreds of years, the sand has been transported to form a geological accident, which serves as a barrier and perpetuates its own growth. The sands of Petraire lie on the side of a mountain and constitute a unique example of this phenomenon. The jewel of the salt marsh is the flamingo. This bird sees its number increased by many thousands when the migratory birds from Europe arrive. Up to a few years ago, it bred on the salt flats of Santa Pola, which was one of the principal breeding areas in the Iberian Peninsula. There are many marsh areas to be found from the north to the south coast. These places are true oases where all life congregates. In just a few regions, we find habitats so different yet so complementary. The salt flats of Santa Pola, the pools of Torvieca la Mata, and the Ondo of Elche and Creviente form a triangle of amphibious habitats which witness the constant coming and going of birds. Each of these marsh areas is of great importance as they form a chain between Europe and Africa. This chain is vital for aquatic birds who need to rest and recover their strength for the long journey. The marshes also give shelter to living creatures with specific needs who can only survive in such surroundings. The avocet 
is one of its most peculiar inhabitants. Its curious upward curving bill allows it to filter food from the water's surface. On isolated hillocks, the avocet builds a simple nest where the female lays up to five eggs, which she incubates for several weeks. When the avocet feels that her nest is threatened, she moves away and pretends that she's hurt in order to attract the attention of the predator and to lead it far away from the eggs. If her exhibition works and the danger passes, the avocet goes quickly back to a point of departure leaving the predator disorientated. The high levels of humidity, salinity and sunshine create excellent conditions for the development of life. The proliferation of the birds in these areas is a prime example of this. The conditions favour the prosperity of both terrestrial and aquatic invertebrates. These are the unseen protagonists of the marshes. Upon their incredible abundance depends much of animal life. Space in the marshes is distributed amongst the occupants according to the length of their beaks and legs. The shores are occupied by dunlins, who feed on invertebrates in the mud whilst in deeper water we find the sandpipers and medium-sized plovers who plunge the depths as far as their extremities will allow. The black-winged stilt has even longer legs which permit it to feed in the deeper areas. But without doubt, the flamingo is the tallest bird which inhabits the enclave and it is able to access the deepest parts of the pools. The most varied and abundant family of birds which live in this medium is the duck family. The obvious difference in plumage distinguishes the sexes. This distinction is used by males to attract the attention of the females and to be recognised by male competitors. On the other hand, the vulnerable females, dedicated to breeding, must appear inconspicuous. Whilst one group of mallards is able to snorkel for food, other ducks, like the spoonbill or the swaddlebill, feed on the surface, using their wide beaks to get at the floating vegetation. The Mediterranean thicket occupies extensive areas in Deesa de Campo Amor, Aiwes, and the Sierra de Creviente. This medium is characterized by its variety of bushy vegetation and by its scattering of trees. 
There are hundreds of species of vegetation typical to the Mediterranean area, like the little palm, surviving in a habitat where life goes on unnoticed. Beneath the shelter of vegetation, there is an incessant activity and the constant struggle for survival. The mountain rabbit benefits from the fruit of trees like the carob tree or the olive tree, which have adapted to this environment. Their resistance to drought makes them excellent allies to the fauna, whilst the birds use holes in the knotted trunks to make their nests. The common great tit makes use of any hollow trunk to make his nest as there are so few upright trees. The Elafe snake takes advantage of this, always aware of the comings and goings of the great tit. For the snake, these chicks are just another meal. For the bird, it means a tragic end to her efforts to breed and the loss of her chicks who were just about to leave the nest. The abundance of bushes is owed to millions of years of evolution. The juniper tree, together with the lentiscus, are common to these areas, as well as the rock rose, which displays colourful flowers in the spring. In this ecosystem, we will find rosemary, thyme, lavender and many other species which belong to the aromatic family of plants, which are traditionally used for medical and cooking purposes. Vegetation and fauna are always connected. The Esparto grass shelters the Algerian turtle, a reptile in danger of extinction, which regularly appears in these arid lands. Its hard shell is an effective defensive asset. It protects the turtle from its natural predators and protects the skin from dehydration caused by the sun. Always on the alert, the rabbit keeps a careful lookout as he's a prized catch for carnivorous animals. He has nothing to fear though from the small but fierce Great Grey Shrike who overlooks his territory from the hawthorn which serves him as a watchtower. Inside its armoured interior he's installed the nest where the female is incubating the eggs, protected by the sharp branches. In the meantime, the male uses its long thorns as a larder upon which he impales his catch for use when the brood is hatched around the month of April. With the chicks to feed, the catch does not last long. At this time, the shrike needs to provide a large number of insects, birds and rodents so that the chicks can grow quickly. In a few days, they will leave the nest thanks to the solicitor's care of the adults. They clean the nest regularly to avoid being located by predators. Their waste is placed in the crop 
and carried far away from the hawthorn. Close to the territory of the great grey shrike, the fox has come to hunt. The smell of the trail he follows is unmistakable. The catch is a hedgehog. When the hedgehog feels threatened, it turns into an impregnable ball. The striped red mouse is an easier catch for the fox. He locates the den easily and digs at it with his sharp claws. After each meal, he marks the area so that there's no doubt about whose territory it is. The once abundant oak forests are now reduced to only a few examples, like the Kermes oak of the Font Roger, the last remaining refuge surrounded by civilization. In contrast, the pine forests have increased, occupying large areas in the mountain ranges of Salinas, Mariola, Buitre and Maigmo. Also found in the woods are other scarce trees, such as the ash, the maple and the gall oak, which animate their surroundings in autumn with the sound and colour of their leaves. This is the season of fruits and the abundance of food, as the rain falls and quenches the thirsty wood. The tawny owl is a night hunter, a bird of prey. During the day, it remains still, camouflaged like a tree trunk. Its nocturnal activities demand a highly developed sense of sight and hearing. The forest ant plays its part in the expansion of the woods, for it buries many seeds which germinate with the aid of the rain. Both the ants and the vegetation have enemies. Pine trees, for example, are devastated by the dreaded pine tree caterpillar, a pest which decimates the forest, leaving behind it scars of the ecological imbalance which can sometimes occur. With the last rays of the sun, the civet begins its work. 
It overlooks the forest from the top of an oak tree, whilst carefully guarding its brood. The old stump where the female gave birth shelters them, whilst the male tries to find the trail of an animal. On this occasion, the female is going to be luckier. In order to hunt one of the most detested animals known to man, she must temporarily abandon her brood. The wild cat, on the brink of extinction, survives in the last remaining woods untouched by the hand of man. Only a few pairs of these felines are left to face the many dangers that await them. The wild cat has become an elusive animal, rarely seen by day. His sharp senses and incomparable agility make him a deadly hunter. ecological well-being of the woods depends on a fine balance between all of its inhabitants, from plants to birds of prey. The ecosystem is in danger if any of these links are either too scarce or too abundant. The buzzard is one of the birds of prey who helps to maintain this balance. Far from being harmful, he kills just the right number of animals, eliminating the sick and the weak, thus maintaining the equilibrium. The rivers running through these natural areas bring with them a great richness in living creatures and landscapes. The riverbanks were protected at first by large trees like black poplars, the ash, the elm and the common poplar, which contained the river. The riverbank forest has almost completely disappeared from our environment and there are only a few isolated examples to be found in remote places like the rivers of Serpis and Vinalapo. The water, as always, provides for an abundance of vegetation. The plants which decorate the landscape close to the rivers perform an endless symphony of shapes and colours. The moorhen, who lives on the banks of the streams, spends most of his time hiding in the thicket. The intermittent movement of his tail sends a message of all's well to his fellows. If the signs stop, the rest of them will be on the alert. The polecat is a mammal with strong links to the riverbeds. With each new generation, their fur becomes progressively lighter in colour. This is because ferret hunters cross-bred them with wild ferrets.
Polecat has spotted a nest of little grebes located on the same part of the river. The exquisite care with which the little grebes cover their eggs when something frightens them usually saves the brood and confounds the assailant. The common toad watches the scene from the shore, unafraid of the polecat, because its skin glands can secrete a toxic substance which many predators cannot stand. The wild boar roams through the watercourses and the rocky riverbeds looking for food. The two long tusks on his face allow him to lift up rocks, excavate the earth and to pull out roots. Almost anything he finds in his path is devoured, insects, rodents, reptiles, even fungus which other animals would reject. In the pools left by the rainfall, the boar takes a beneficial mud bath to clean his coat and to rid himself of irritating parasites. With the first snowfall of winter, another natural cycle begins. The cold slows down the pulse of life, which awaits its fall into a long sleep beneath the snow. The enormous volume of water, which is gradually produced by a thaw which lasts until spring, is welcomed by the earth. The snow forms a protective layer over the earth and provides water whenever it's needed. The vegetation which colonizes the upper parts of the mountain ranges appears hard and thorny. Its lack of height is due to its need to survive beneath the snow, to avoid offering any resistance to the wind, and because it has to hang vertically. Extending like a spine between the valleys and penetrating several kilometers into the sea is a great stony mass. Its vertical walls and its bare peaks shelter life forms which are accustomed to austerity. The mountain ranges of Aitana, Bernia, Montgau 
and Puch Campana cast their shadows over the splendid valleys below them. From the lichen-covered stones, the scorpion welcomes the first rays of the sun. Returning to its den underneath a rock, it sees another member of its species. The wedding dance of the scorpion appears more like a confrontation, and in a way it is. At any moment, either of the participants could kill the other by injecting poison with their sting. In this dance of death, the male tries to immobilize the tail of the female whilst he tries to convince her of his good intentions. But she's not interested, and she doesn't hesitate to reject her suitor. The raven makes its nest in holes high above the ground which are inaccessible to any predator. Food is more abundant on the plains and it goes there to find it. He mostly eats carrion, but he also hunts small animals like lizards or mice. The golden eagle is the absolute ruler of the summit. It has a majestic bearing and powerful claws which allow it to bring down prey of considerable size and strength. With its penetrating sight, it's able to detect the slightest movement from several kilometers. In nature, life and death go hand in hand. This mutual dependence means that death signifies in its turn life for other beings. <coughs> 